packet pushers. Welcome to the IP Physics Buzz, where we dare to dive into the 128-bit outer space wormhole. I'm Ed Horley. And I'm Scott Hogue. On the show, we discuss all things IPv6, strategy, design, deployment, and operations. And I'm Tom Coffeen. We've spent 20 plus years working with the IPv6 protocol. We run a consulting firm where we get IPv6 working for our customers. And we're here to share some lessons learned on how to avoid common mistakes. We're glad you joined us today. Today, we're going to be talking with our guest, Alexandra Wiedisch, who works for AWS. And you may have seen some of her blog posts and streams because she does a tremendous amount of talking about IPv6 and AWS networking. And we wanted to talk specifically about what she's doing with V6 and just what's going on with AWS around V6. So welcome, Alex. Thank you, Ed. Hi, folks. Awesome being with you here today on the show. I'm super excited. You folks are legends, especially in the IPv6 world. So super excited to join you today. And thank you for having me. Of course. Well, maybe we start off with you giving us a bit of background about your experience with maybe V6 before you started working with AWS, because I know you were doing stuff before AWS around V6. So it's good to get a little bit of background about like sort of experience and what you had done and maybe where your interests were around it. So I've been in the networking world since I was in university. So actually a bit more than 12 years now. I have experience in the classical networking or actually quote unquote real networking, not the cloud networking before joining AWS. Actually, my journey started with not really liking IPv6. So around 15 years ago, as I was in university and I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, I decided that I didn't like the programming part and that I wouldn't be an amazing software engineer. So the other alternative was networking. And I started learning networking. I started uh, remembering IPv4 addresses that I was pinging. And when I first acquainted myself with IPv6, I was like, oh my God, why do I need to know this? Like these addresses are so long and so hard to remember. Like, no, I'm never going to like this. I'm never going to learn it. I hate it. Not good. Then as like my career progressed, I um, went through the CCIE training. So I got a lot of hands-on experience and During that time, I used to work for a telco, and very interestingly, IPv6 was part of the backbone routing. So like, okay, I need to become better at this. However, even then the CCIE exam at the time, IPv6 wasn't that big of a deal. Years later, uh, I was working with my former employer, and we were trying to figure out how can we get broader client coverage for some of the services that we were deploying on AWS. And that's essentially where my love for IPv6 started, because part of the solution was an analytics tool that could show where clients were accessing and what IP addresses clients were using to access the application endpoints. And once we enabled IPv6, I could see in real how much traffic was starting to flow natively over IPv6. So yeah, kind of that's my story with IPv6. And then when I joined AWS, actually, I came with a purpose. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) I'm going to be a networking specialist and I would love to focus on IPv6, IPv6 adoption, how we can help our customers accelerate this journey. And yeah, here I am. Almost four years later, everyone who meets me or everyone who hears my name is like, oh, I can be sick. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen quite a few of your presentations that you've given for different organizations. So, I mean, you're quite prolific out there at this point. I'm sure you're getting a lot of invitations to come and speak because obviously everyone is keenly interested in getting V6 sort of working in public cloud and obviously writing solution briefs and blog articles and giving presentations is now a norm for you, I imagine. (laughs) So that's very, very cool. And you went through the same journey that all of us went through, which was a a head scratching about what the heck is this V6 thing around? Everyone starts there. It's all (laughs) confusing in the beginning. But (laughs) funny enough, V4 is the exact same way for everyone too. They just seem to somehow forget that that's the process you go through. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. There's a bit of career overlap there. I remember studying for CCIE, doing a boot camp. There was like a bit of V6, mm-hmm. and that was like back in the 2006 time frame. And I remember there was a part of the config that was all about getting NAT IPv6 working, <laughs> yeah, which at the time was sort of early days, and it wasn't like a deadly enemy of NAT yet. It just was like a thing that everyone did and didn't think too much about it. But for whatever mm-hmm. reason on the Cisco platform of the time that we we're doing the boot camp on, I could not get, I think it was probably NAT 6.6, although my memory... Or NAT P. 
NatPT. I've racked my brain and I don't think it was NatPT, but in any case, it just didn't work. Like the configuration was just broken. So, <laughs> yeah. so that was my first exposure to actually configuring IPv6. But there's something here. This is interesting. Yeah, his first exposure and it was failure. <laughs> it was failure. <laughs> it was Nat6 and it was failure. I think all our first encounters with IPv6 can be safely described as partial or total <laughs> failures. <laughs> it's a new thing. It's very different. Is there something that you've learned around v6 that you find sort of unique or interesting, especially compared to v4? Tom Scott and I have been doing this for so long that <laughs> it's sort of hard to come up with head scratchers for folks around making it relatable. But I think something unique in terms of maybe innovation areas or other things that you've been like, oh, that's really interesting. We always talk about sort of business value and sort of unlimited resources, which is what we normally sort of talk about from a V6 perspective. But I don't know if there's been anything in your past that you find that was super interesting about it and something you find sort of unique. Probably a couple of things, but the one that I keep being amazed by every day is the shift in mindset around what a scalable addressing plan is. And I'm not saying that because Tom, you're here, but I love your book. <laughs> but the IPv4 comes with the mindset of subnetting based on the number of posts that you think you're going to have in a network or in a subnet or in a VPC to be more specific, right? The Amazon virtual private cloud. However, in IPv6, that mindset, it doesn't fit the way I think addressing works to get you to a scalable and extensible addressing plan. And oftentimes I talk to my customers and I talk to folks in the field and they're always like, oh, why do you slash 64 subnets? Like, why can't we just have smaller subnets so that we don't waste like, the addresses? Like mindset folks, the slash 64 and slash 48 for regions and slash 56 for site essentially in AWS VPCs make a lot of sense from like RFC perspective and from a that scalable deployment perspective. And I get the two minutes of silence as they think through it and they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And we're like not wasting IP addresses and like, no, it's, it's not about wasting IPv6 addresses. We have a lot of them. And I think it's more about how do we get IP address management in a much simpler manner than what we had with before. It's really a struggle for a lot of engineers and architects who've just been so steeped in IPv4 to let go of the reflex to, as you say, use you know subnetting, variable link subnet masking, doing everything on bit boundaries, and just thinking of efficiency in terms of a host address preservation. And it's almost as if there has to be a generational turnover. There are so many folks, like include myself in that category. I remember getting the first allocations working at a large service provider and getting the first like three slash 32s from different providers and immediately setting about the task of how am I going to carve these up like into little tiny subnets that I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with and know from everything I've done in IPv4. And it's just so hard to let go of that reflex for a lot of folks. And so getting them over that hump into that place where they're designing the address plan, just recognizing that that, you know, they're just host addresses are not even relevant. I mean, it's just like talking about host address preservation is a joke when you have 64 bits of interface identifier. Yeah. But then more critically, just like being comfortable with having a lot of prefixes in reserve that you may not ever number into. It just freaks people out and engineers and architects out. And I get it. I've been there. Yeah. You're almost going from one extreme with IPv4 where they're so scarce and so precious, the addresses to IPv6 where addresses and even slash 64s are disposable. Yeah. Put them on VPC subnets, delete them, move them, <laughs> delete them again, kill them, rebuild them. In a software driven way, you can have things just be disposable like that. And the addressing is also disposable and you'll not run out. Yeah, it doesn't feel very earth friendly, but luckily it's just a logical abstraction. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that gets to the second piece that's extremely interesting from my perspective in, in terms of IPv6, which is the mindset of associating security controls with IP addresses, which is a mindset very typical for IPv4, as in I'm going to allow these IPs to talk to these other IPs. And I think with the new generation that Tom, you were talking about, there's more and more thinking around IP addresses are not a security mechanism, right? If your own security mechanism is, I'm not going to allow IP1 to talk to IP2 by not allowing reachability or by doing that, that's another thing. 
you should be thinking more about security and all the security implications of the environment, not just IP address. But I think with more and more adoption of IPv6, developers nowadays start thinking about network is there and it has to work. And then on top of that, I add all the security filtering functionality, authentication, authorization, and so on. IP addresses are not a security mechanism. And that's my personal opinion. And I heard a lot of pros and cons around this, but this is one of the reasons why I do believe personally strongly in IPv6, because I've been in so many occasions uh, facing the challenges related to just creating connectivity with IPv4 and enabling workloads to communicate to each other in an effective, cost-efficient manner. I see how IPv6 makes that so easy. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm sold. It's just a transition that we're going through, moving from a physical networking topology to a virtual topology, where applications, it's more about exposing an endpoint or an API, or it's serverless, and you don't really even care about the address, or it's something like AWS VPC Lattice. Mm -hmm. It just automatically handles the networking and security, and you don't need to be bothered with addresses. And the addresses can come and go, just like a container gets an address, but it's ephemeral and it lives for a while and then it disappears and a new one comes in. So when the new one is instantiated and has a new address, you don't want to go issue a ServiceNow ticket to the firewall administrator to update <laughs> the address. You know, that's such old school way of thinking. And I'm actually glad that you brought up VPC Lattice because... It's actually one of those services that Abstract completely addresses. It does provide for every service, a V4 and a V6 resource record in the F FQDN. Other than that, you don't care about IP addresses anymore. And that is what modern application networking and application connectivity means. Mm -hmm. Because developers more and more start not knowing about networking, like the deep core networking constructs of routing and route tables and reachability and BGP and all of that. These are kind of topics that are not very well mastered by a lot of the new generation, I think. Yeah. I was talking to an enterprise client about, they were asking, well, how do we assess applications for IPv6 capability? And I'm like, they probably already are. They're probably web-based applications that are written on top of a web service. The application's not writing TCP socket, not handling <laughs> path MTU discovery in their code and retransmission and selected acknowledgement. They didn't, you know, start writing their web app by opening up, you know, Stephen's <laughs> book on TCP IP programming. They're written at an abstraction level that's much higher, even for web-based applications. And I'm like, if the web service in the host OS gets a V6 address on the NIC or virtual interface, it's just going to work. And the application developers don't even know what an address is or even what a TCP socket is. Or flows or all of these network constructs. That just shows progress in terms of the capabilities, that abstraction is actually to the benefit of everyone who's running a network because mm -hmm. it means that changing things later down the line become easier. That abstraction gives us the capabilities to, you know, move from V6 to whatever the V next thing is going to be for, you know, however many decades down the road <laughs> that will be. But but you need that sort of capability there. So I think that's actually a, a positive overall. And I think you know, to be quite honest, the constructs that the public cloud providers have, have put out there and AWS, you know, definitely being a forefront leader in this is providing those abstractions to actually make that easier to do, right? That sort of API driven development and resources not having to be managed in the same way has really given the capability to be comfortable with that set of abstractions and not have to feel so tied to it. And like we don't feel maybe back in the day, decade, 15 years ago, you felt like you were holding on tight to your IPv4 addresses, right? <laughs> you had very specific scripts that you knew exactly every single address that you had. And, and today you just don't care about that stuff in, in anywhere near the same, the same way, except for the fact that you need an address pool, right? To be able to operate or, or use. And even that is probably provisioned by your cloud provider and you're not even doing anything specific around that. So for an application developer, it makes sense that they don't care about addresses at all. And it actually makes sense from a development standpoint that you wouldn't want them involved with that because it's just too far down the stack. I think that's a good progression. You work with a lot of customers on network design, architectures, and using those related components and infrastructures within AWS. 
do you see something that's pretty common sort of across the board with struggles that they deal with when first sort of working with V6? And you mentioned the first one already, which was sort of getting used to the address allocation plan and how to think about that plan in terms of how that structurally works. But are there other areas that you see customers really struggle with in terms of understanding things around V6? Or are there shortcuts where you're like, oh, don't worry about that. Just use this inside of our cloud platform to solve that particular problem. Are the things that you sort of notice, you know, time and time again? Thanks for being a Packet Pushers listener. Did you know we've got other IT-related shows you might want to check out, like Heavy Wireless? Heavy Wireless is a deep dive into Wi-Fi, IoT, wireless security, and more. It's hosted by Keith Parsons. He brings decades of experience to conversations with wireless engineers, industry experts, and vendors. So whether you're a YLAN specialist already or looking to expand your skill sets, Heavy Wireless gives you the technical know-how and industry insights to succeed. Find it at PacketPushers.net or wherever you get your podcasts. I think a few of them, and I think our focus is, you brought up some of these services that help simplify. That's the goal. The idea is to help enable developers to have that focus on what brings value to the business and to the enterprise, the company, the customer. So as we're talking about IPv6, and not just IPv6, this is part of a broader network modernization and infrastructure modernization topic. The top challenges in terms of IPv6 are, from what I see, more around the mindset and that change that needs to permeate and happen and the idea of, I don't know what's going to break, so I'm just not going to do it. And I think part of my daily routine of, of talking to customers about IPv6 is let's work backwards because that's what we do. That's what we do as AWS as well. Let's work backwards from a use case that you would like to solve. Like, I don't know, private IPv4 exhaustion, um, optimizing costs and things like that. And figuring out how you can start with IPv6 without creating a big bang out of it, right? And without boiling the water in your entire organization and how you can leverage some of these services that facilitate this transition and um, help you accelerate adoption of IPv6 in these small use cases. And what this helps is with the second challenge, which is related to showing the value of investing in IPv6 adoption and showing the benefits. So once you get some small wins, right, you're able to say, look, I've done this. This is the benefit that this brought. Let's start extending uh, the, the reach. So those are kind of the, the biggest areas. Services like VPC Lattice help immensely because you can have an IPv4 service or an IPv6 aware service. You can have IPv4 aware clients or IPv6 aware clients. It doesn't matter because it natively provides you with dual stack capabilities. So whatever client capabilities are, whatever service capabilities are, you're good to go. Private Link is another service that helps with this as well. It again provides dual stack capabilities irrespective of what the service or the client capabilities are. I think part of this making it easy for teams and builders to build the interoperability between IPv4 and IPv6 is super important. Yeah, I think just like we were talking about how people may not know or application teams or builders may not know about addresses, they may not know that they have to turn IPv6 on or it's something that may not come automatically. AWS has many services that have IPv6 enabled by default. S3 buckets is a classic one, you know, but there's others like LightSail and AppStream and CloudFront distributions that come by default with v6 yep. enabled. Do you see that as a trend that more and more services will start to have IPv6 enabled by default and then it won't be anything people have to consider, it'll just be the de facto default launch method. Um, I think as long as we are working backwards from the customer needs and we enable them to get where they need to be, our goal is to get IPv6 supported across AWS services to, to enable this. So if like LightSail, for example, I've worked together with the, with the service team on this, and it was a great thing to see 
how this came to life and how IPv6 support was added and what the customer impact was and uh, how customers adopted it. I would say that given the increase in uh, in adoption, given government mandates, we have publicly stated in uh, in a blog how we are supporting IPv6 adoption or according to these mandates. So I would say that that's the path. The path is to getting to IPv6 support and availability across all AWS services. I think that's really critical. I think there's also some confusion too, because some of the mandates, especially the US federal government mandate that obviously puts pressure on AWS and all the other cloud providers and every single SaaS provider too, it's not unique around having IPv6 support and capabilities within their platform is, is super important and it's driving a lot of behavior. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want our audience to get confused. AWS isn't required to run their infrastructure as V6 only, right? It's, totally. it's just that yeah. you need to be able to provide V6 services to the customers so that they can operate V6 within your platform. It's, it's subtle, but sometimes confusing. If you're running your own infrastructure and you're you know, a federal operator of some type, you may be required to run your infrastructure as v6 only, but it doesn't mean that your interconnect and, and AWS has to run their stuff. So I imagine you get a couple yeah. of questions from folks on that side that are like, are you guys running v6 only? And it's like, well, we don't have to. We, we provide v6 as a service as an additional component. We can continue to move forward to add those sorts of capabilities within our platform itself. I know it sounds nuanced, but I think it's important for folks to understand. So when you're talking about dual stack for AWS, that fits within the mandate requirements of most of the organizations that you would be interacting with as customers, correct? I think it, depending on how it makes sense for each service, I, I'm not an expert in all AWS services. Most of them I'm finding out after we launched them that we did and I'm like, oh, wow, this is a new service or this is a new feature or capability. As things make sense, uh, we do have teams who are looking at what these mandates are doing and like requiring and as we're looking also at commercial customers, like let's say I start running my application endpoint on AWS because it's a service. The most often adoption path that I see for IPv6 is to dual stack that endpoint because I cannot, if I run my application on AWS, I cannot assume that if I make it IPv6 only, I will actually be able to accommodate all clients of my application accessing me. We're still not there yet with 100% adoption of IPv6 on the internet. So dual stack endpoints for services make a lot of sense. We completely agree with you. That makes a tremendous amount of sense. You want to be able to speak both languages, English and French as it would be or whatever, and V4, V6, you need to address both markets. And it's important for you folks, uh, given where you're at, to be able to provide that as a, as a capability uh, for anyone who's going to develop or build services inside of AWS and have them publicly consumed or even privately internally on the commercial side to do the same thing. It's basically just providing more widgets and capabilities within your platform to do that. What's great is just having the plethora of V6 addresses even, you know, sort of enhances the sort of scalability story that AWS has been telling since the beginning, right? In terms of saying resources, capabilities, just the vast reach that you folks have from a footprint basis. And that's important for those that may not be aware that, you know, IPv4 wasn't handed out equally across the world, right? In terms of resources. <laughs> Right. And there's a whole sets of demographics that, you know, V6 is really the only way they're going to grow their market because that's really all they have available to them. And not everyone is living in the U.S. and has that as a primary footprint and may have, quote unquote, plenty of IPv4. And we don't understand what the problem is. Well, it's not just you. It's everyone else. Right. And being able to address that market and you guys having V6 available is, is, is one of the ways to do that, which I think is pretty cool. I would say that even outside of the public IPv4 space on, on the private side, if you have an Amazon EKS cluster, for example, and you run your containers and um, your cluster grows and you say, oh, I don't actually have private IPv4 addresses to allocate to this VPC to allow this cluster to grow. That's even a bigger problem because you are essentially limited by the space that RFC 1918 provides. And we do have customers who are looking at how do we go about this problem and how do we solve it? IPv6 is a really, really good option that helps also simplify. I know we've been doing NAT for a really long time <laughs> and private NAT is available in AWS and you can use it to interconnect overlapping VPC. But for how long should we be continuing to doing private NAT? That's the question. The native IPv6 reachability is much cleaner and simpler and effective from my security perspective to 
understand flows and to control connectivity. Yeah. And faster. <laughs> oh, yes. But for security teams, I got a log in my security information event management system for 10.10.10.1. And it's some attack. Where is that? <laughs> which account, which region, which VPC, if you have overlaps, there's no uniqueness to that address. And your forensics is limited because you've reused the address multiple times. It overlaps many things. But with IPv6, each region, account, organizations, you know, VPCs, everything, subnets, availability zones, all have their own addresses, no overlaps, and you gain greater situational awareness. Yeah. Not to mention another one of the really good use cases for IPv6 adoption and what it brings is getting to the place where mergers and acquisitions and companies' environment needing to be interconnected no longer poses a multi-year challenge of, oh, we have overlapping IP space. Okay, we're not going to interconnect for some time uh, or it's going to take us 6 to 12 to 18 months to figure out how we're going to do it, how we're going to VIP, if we're going to VIP and, and so on. That's a good one because given the speed and often probably the fact that so many companies are already running their workloads up at new folks, they can very quickly get V6 native services running across the board and interconnect those services if they wanted to. And they know they've got globally unique addresses. They don't have to worry about the routing. They don't have to worry about addressing those resources and dealing with NAT, like you said. Every network engineer is grateful for that because if any network engineer has ever been stuck on a readdressing project, <laughs> that's where you go to get demoted <laughs> in, in, in workforce effort, for sure. Those are all fantastic points. I guess the next logical thing is we have audience folks who are sitting there like, well, how do I get started with V6 at AWS? Like, what's my jump off point to get going besides just randomly clicking in the UI or playing around with anything in the API, how would you advise they get going? And do you have architecture and reference docs for folks to, to go check out? Yes, absolutely. This has been part of my journey here, which was to get more documentation published on how customers can get started with IPv6 on AWS. And we'll post in the, in the comments the link to an AWS repos article that sums up all the resources that are available for everyone to go through on categories of like, I want to do the edge first adoption. So outside in, I want to start with my services and then slowly go into the internal network where I want to start with my internal network supporting v6 routing and reachability and then I'm going to start adding uh, v6 to my services depending on the adoption strategy there's content there there's reference architectures there's guidance around how to start with an addressing plan that's probably the most important thing to start with considerations around using AWS allocated uh, IPv6 addresses versus bring your own IP and uh, if there are requirements for either or. I would say that probably the most important thing is what you said, uh, which is the idea of getting a bit of experience with IPv6. And if that experience is going into console and creating a VPC and adding IPv6 to it and going through I don't know, the, the blog post that says, this is how you dual stack your VPC and your EC2 instances. And you get to ping six actually on an uh, IPv6 enabled endpoint. That's really good experience. And this type of experience is needed because I think one of the biggest challenges or detractors for adoption is the fact that IPv6 is new. I know folks are going to laugh and you're going to say, well, it's been 28 years. It's not really that new. It is new for everyone who is looking at adoption these days. And even if it's been around for a very long time, we've always been as an industry overall in the space of we'll do it when we'll do it or we'll never get there. I think we will. I personally think we will. And that's why I'm putting so much energy into it. So yeah, I think getting some experience and hands-on experience, identifying then these small projects that you can work on to, to get IPv6 uh, enabled and to add to that experience, identifying the low-hanging fruits in terms of benefits for adopting IPv6 is a really good way to. And going, of course, through all the resources and documentation, asking questions, 
We are present on social media. We have a show called The Rocking Loop every Thursday, where myself with a team of awesome uh, network specialists here at, uh, at AWS, we answer questions, we go through architectures on all things, not just IPv6, but if you folks ask IPv6 questions, I'm sure all of us are going to be extremely excited to answer them. So yeah, and I think last but not least, let us know what are we missing in terms of documentation materials that would help you accelerate adoption. That's cool. And I do highly recommend folks check out the blog articles that you've put together. They're very well written and very nicely put together and do a great job explaining it. And you also have a lot of presentations you've given at the UK IPv6 Council with Veronica and team over there. <laughs> I think you're giving one soon, right? I want to say May 20th. Yes. That might be of interest for folks to go check out. There's a lot of good stuff in terms of just explaining the fundamentals about IPv6, how it works within AWS, because networking is fundamentally a little bit different in cloud service mm -hmm. providers than they are necessarily for what you're used to on-prem and having a more fundamental understanding of how it works in the public clouds will give you a leg up. Obviously, understanding how IPv4 operates in AWS is important. IPv6 has similar constructs, but obviously less limitations, how we put it that way, <laughs> in terms of in terms of pure address space and what you can deploy and what you can operate, which is good to know. Was there anything super interesting or cool that you've seen with v6 on AWS that you just wanted to sort of hype up or mention as we were wrapping up here? A lot of interesting things that I'm seeing every day and we're seeing with customers who are on this journey relate to how it unlocks simplified connectivity. Uh, one of my recent engagements was around getting native connectivity for VPCs using AWS Cloud One globally and routing IPv6 traffic over Cloud One. And together with Amazon VPC IPAM, which helped you natively and globally create your addressing plan and make sure it's scalable and extensible, this customer integrated Cloud One with IPAM and got to implementing V6 native routing on AWS for all their VPCs without having any impact to, to applications. So this was a starting point. And now the work starts with, let's get applications to use V6 DNS, essentially, <laughs> and domain names and to resolve to IPv6 addresses and use them. I think this is one, and it was super exciting to see those pings work, as I mentioned. And the second one was related to a customer who, in the process of adopting Amazon VPC Lattice, also decided to get V6 support for the applications. So they started mapping VPC Lattice uh, FQDNs to domain names of their custom applications using both A and Quad A and applications starting to natively use v6 because they were running on operating systems that were natively enabled for v6 so it was cool to see on the network ipv6 traffic flowing to and from clients natively without application changes to enable that yeah that's really exciting and there's a whole slew of services that are available inside of advs around v4 and v6 and i definitely recommend the audience check all those out and i'm sure you will be blogging about more and more of them as they come back yes so I'm sure there's lots of stuff in queue. <laughs> we do have a page that lists a lot of the AWS services that support IPv6 and for what they support IPv6. So it's a big table. Uh, we're constantly updating that, so keep an eye on it. And as you mentioned, we will be present at RIPE 88 in Krakow. So I'll be talking about IPv6 in a tutorial. So looking forward to seeing you all there. And there's more to come. Fantastic. How can folks follow you on the internet? Is there a specific place you'd like to interact or, or deal with folks on I mean, uh, Twitter or X or LinkedIn? Or is there something else that you sort of point people to? Or are you just like, hey, just reach out and catch me on Twitch for the next show? Definitely. So I'm more of a LinkedIn person. Uh, I was never caught by either Twitter or X or threads. So I'm just on LinkedIn. So that's probably the, the best place to reach out. Also, absolutely, every Thursday, 10.30 a.m. Pacific to 12 p.m. Pacific, we are live on Twitch. And if I'm not there, then my colleagues are there. And they would love, trust me, for you to ask them IPv6 questions related to all the topics that they're talking about. Fantastic. You've heard it here, folks. Go on Twitch and ask all your hard IPv6 questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, it was great talking with you, Alex. We really appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the show and talking about AWS and IPv6.
Thank you. And it was awesome being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to meet you folks and talk to you. And yeah, IPv6 for the win. Thanks for joining us for this episode of IPv6 Buzz. If you've got feedback or a follow-up on this topic, send us a message at packetpushers.net slash FU. We'd love to hear from you and continue the conversation. Also, on packetpushers.net, you'll find a range of deep dive technical podcasts for IT pros, including heavy networking, heavy wireless, and day two cloud. There's a whole lot more on the Packet Pushers site as well, such as tutorial videos and a networking job board to help you find or fill your next great role. So whether you're deep in your career or just starting up, Packet Pushers is the place to go to grow both your skills and your personal network. So long and until next time, we'll see you on the IPv6 internet.